take your Bible tonight for our scripture reading to Psalm 12, please. The 12th Psalm. Psalms chapter 12 and just going to read two verses in unison together tonight. Verses 6 and 7. Psalm 12 verses 6 and 7. As our custom is, let's stand together to read the scripture. All of us standing, please, to read God's word. And let's begin together on verse 6, and we'll read verse 6 and 7 together. Ready? The words of the Lord are pure words. Has silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. And let's pray, shall we? Father, add your blessing to the scripture that we are reading here this evening. Other scriptures that we'll look at during our message tonight. Uh, thank you, Lord, for just a wonderful day so far in the house of God. Thank you for uh, wonderful music here tonight, the wonderful spirit that's here in this place. And, Lord, we ask you to minister to our hearts through your word this evening. Lord, tune our hearts now to your heart. Help us uh, to stay focused upon you during this time we have together as we look into your word. Bless the special. In Jesus' name, amen. Father, we bow before you in prayer. We want to thank you tonight for your word. Thank you, Lord, for preserving your word and allowing us to have copies of it in our hand tonight. Lord, I'm asking you now to open our understanding as we look into your word this evening. Lord, I pray you'll help me as I bring this study, and please help each individual as they listen. And Holy Spirit of God, do in each one of our hearts what you desire to do, what you would like to accomplish in each one of our lives. In Jesus' name I ask it. Amen. I want to give you some 
Well, let me ask you this. How many Bibles, how many Bibles do you think there are uh, right now on the market? Uh, somebody says, think there's 200? Think there's 100? How many think there's 200 or more? How many think there's 100? Anybody? How many think there's 10? How many think there's only one? How many there's only one? Now, let me tell you this. Yeah, you're, all, you're all thinking, wait a minute, what's he doing, right? There are, the, the truth is, what you'll find out, that there's only two. There's only two sources of Bible manuscripts that we get our Bible from. There's only two places they come from, all right? And that is, there's two families of manuscripts. One of those families uh, comes from Alexandria, Egypt. The other set of manuscripts comes from Antioch and Syria. And both of those locations, listen, not only give us manuscripts, but they give us philosophy or ideology as well. All right? And, and that's important to remember. Which one is correct? Which one gives us the Bible? Which one is trustworthy? And, you know, the, because how many understand this? How many have read, how many have read or looked at more than one English translation of the Bible? Put your hand up. Most everybody here. And you realize that they're not all the same. There's differences. Different wording, sometimes different number of verses and things. And, and you think, well, there, there's something I learned a long time ago that things that are different are not the same. And so there's differences. Now, which one is trustworthy? And you don't have to be a Greek scholar or a Hebrew scholar to determine which one is right. The good news is God gave us the answer in the Bible. In, you just know the Bible and God gave us the answer. I believe, by the way, I believe every answer you would ever want for anything in life will be found in the Word of God. Uh, I, if you don't have the exact, I'm not saying God's going to say live in the you know, blue house on the corner of Elm and Spruce, you know, but I'm saying that there'll be principles that will guide you. If we just know the Word well enough, we'll find the principles that will guide us in every decision we make. So we're going to look at the Bible. Now, before we do that tonight, I want us all to agree on something. All right? I want us to agree that the Bible is our final authority in all matters of faith and practice. Would you agree with that? Would you agree? All right. So the Bible's going to be our final authority. Not what I say. Not what you say. Not what I think. Not what you think. Whatever the Bible says, the Bible's right. Are you okay with that? Are we all right? Okay, we're going to stay with that. We're going to, that's going to be our standard that we go by, okay? I don't care if you use the King James or you use the NIV or you use the NASB or you use the ESV or any of the other lettered versions, uh, whatever you're using, it, that, that's okay. Just let's agree that the Bible will be our final authority, okay? And we'll see what the Bible has to say about these two sources of manuscripts. And by the way, that's research researchable. It's verifiable. You go Google it if you want. There's only two families. Alexandrian manuscripts or Antioch are what's called the received text manuscripts. Those are the two places. That's it. Okay? There's are there those are only two places that it comes from. Let's see what the Bible says about these places. All right? Take your Bible. You're going to use your Bible tonight, all right? Let's start in the book of Genesis, all right? Now, we're going to look at what the Bible says, first of all, about this place called Egypt, all right? Now, when you study Scripture, there's a law of Bible study called the law of first mention. The law of first mention. And, and by the way, let me put a disclaimer or, or a, on this so you know. This material I'm sharing with you, and I use it in our Christian growth class as well, this is not my material. It's not original with me. Uh, Sam Gipp is the one I heard it from. 
and I don't believe it's original with him. I think he got it from somebody, all right? Uh, maybe we all go with Solomon and say there's nothing new under the sun. I don't know, but uh, it's, it, it's not, don't, don't think, wow, you're really smart. No, I'm just telling you what somebody else who was really smart figured out, all right? And uh, I, I'm just relaying the message tonight, all right? So this is the law of first mention. And what, what's the law of first mention when you study the Bible? The law of first mention when you study the Bible is that if uh, when... Whatever context something is mentioned the first time it's mentioned in the Bible will determine how that's going to be used throughout the rest of the Bible. In other words, if something's mentioned in a good light the first time it's mentioned, it's generally going to be mentioned in a good light all the way through the Bible. If it's mentioned in a negative or a bad light, it will be mentioned in a negative light generally throughout the whole Bible. It's called the law of first mention. Now, the the first mention of Egypt in the Bible is here in Genesis chapter 12. Notice with me in verse number 10. And there was a famine in the land, and Abram went down into Egypt to sojourn there, for the famine was grievous in the land. And it came to pass, when he was come near to enter into Egypt, That he said unto Sarai, his wife, Behold now, I know that thou art a fair woman to look upon. Therefore it shall come to pass, when the Egyptians shall see thee, that they shall say, This is his wife. And they will kill me, but they will save thee alive. So here we have the first mention of Egypt. And it's a place where Abraham and Sarai are going to go because there's a famine. But Abraham has one slight concern. His slight concern is, they're going to kill me and take my wife. All right? Now, think about that for a minute. If I said, if I said, um, Brother uh, Xavier, I got a great place to take a vacation for you and your wife, Felicia. Beautiful palm trees, desert, beautiful resorts. You're going to just love it. There's, there's just one, one tiny problem. They may kill you and steal your wife. Is that a deal breaker? Huh? Yeah, that would be a deal breaker, huh? That, that wouldn't be the place you'd want to go. I don't think any, any, you know, I hope no wife here would say, sounds good to me, all right? <laughs> I hope that's not true. And is the, is the policy paid up? You know, no, I don't want you to think that. Um, but would you agree? Not really a positive mention here. Not really a positive context. It's the first mention, and it's a place where they may kill you and steal your wife. Okay? Would you agree that's negative? Okay? That's a negative context, all right? Now, let's go to another mention of Egypt. Let's turn in your Bible to Exodus chapter 1. Exodus chapter 1. And, of course, there's other times it's mentioned in Genesis, but let's look in the book of Exodus chapter 1. Here's another reference in another instance of the Jews. Now we know they're in captivity in Egypt. They've gone down there under Joseph, and then Joseph has passed away, and there arises a, a Pharaoh that doesn't know Joseph. All right, And he's put the, the, the children of Israel um, under bondage. Verse 11, it says, Therefore they, that's the Egyptian, did set over them, that's the Israelites, taskmasters to afflict them with their burdens. And they built for Pharaoh treasure cities, Python and Ramses. But the more they afflicted them, the more they multiplied and grew, and they were grieved because of the children of Israel. And the Egyptians made the children of Israel serve with rigor. Rigor simply means strictness or exactness. Uh, there was, there was without, without any allowance for error. Okay, that's what rigor means. And so they were slaves in Egypt. They had taskmasters set over them. They were were very harsh and very hard on them. And by the way, when you read later on in chapter 1, you read that that all the male Jewish children that would be born, what were the midwives supposed to do to them? Kill them. First abortions in the Bible. Okay? Murder all the babies. All the male babies were to be killed. Again, uh, boy, that's a positive connotation, isn't it? No, that's a negative one. Another negative when it comes to Egypt. All right? Now, what does God say about Egypt? 
What would God say in his own words about Egypt? Look at Exodus chapter 20. Exodus chapter 20. Exodus chapter 20, verse number 1. God says, God spake all these words, saying, I am the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. So this time, from the mouth of God, what does God call Egypt? House of bondage. Okay, this time it's what God said from his own mouth. Now, what about Moses? Moses grew up in Egypt. What would Moses say about Egypt? Look at Deuteronomy chapter 4. Deuteronomy chapter 4. Deuteronomy 4, notice with me verse number 20. Deuteronomy 4 and verse number 20. Moses says this, But the Lord hath taken you, and brought you forth out of the, what church? Iron furnace, even out of Egypt, to be unto him a people of inheritance as ye are this day. Moses refers to Egypt as an iron furnace. Again, I, nobody here says, well, I can't wait to get home tonight. I think I'll relax in my iron furnace. No, it's not the place you want to be. You don't want to go there. It's a negative connotation look a little further in Deuteronomy look at Deuteronomy 17 God's giving instructions to Israel about when the time will come when they'll want a king to be over them and he gives specific instructions about the king not multiplying horses to himself he says in verse number 16 of Deuteronomy 17, he says, But he shall not multiply horses to himself, nor cause the people to return to Egypt, to the end that he should multiply horses. For as much as the Lord has said, you shall henceforth return no more that way. He said he wants to multiply horses. There is one place he's not to go to get horses. Where is he not to go? Egypt. You don't go to Egypt to the end to multiply horses. Now, look in the New Testament with me, will you? Go all the way to the last book of the New Testament. Go to the book of Revelation. Revelation chapter 11. Revelation chapter 11. The two witnesses are now with, uh, during the tribulation period. And they're preaching the gospel during the tribulation period. And the Antichrist has them put to death. Their bodies lay in the street. And when their bodies lay in the street, notice chapter 11 of Revelation and verse 8. It says, Their dead bodies shall lie in the street of that great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. Where was the Lord crucified? What city? Jerusalem. Now he says spiritually God's calling Jerusalem and he thinks of the two worst places he could call it and he called it Sodom and Egypt. Again, positive or negative? Negative. So we see that everyone in every instance and then well, I'm not telling you anything if you've studied the Bible much that you don't already know. Egypt is never mentioned in a good light in the Bible. It's always in a bad connotation. Now, look at the book of Acts in your Bible. Let's, let's see, what does the Bible say about Alexandria? Alexandria, Egypt. And, and frankly, when I first had seen this and heard this, I didn't know the Bible said anything about it. If you'd asked me what it say about Alexandria, I'd have said, I don't know that it says anything, but let's see what it says. Notice in Acts chapter 6. Acts chapter 6, the church has multiplied greatly in Jerusalem. Thousands of people have been saved. Thousands of people have been added to the church. Tens of thousands, possibly. And, and some of the widows were being neglected. The church was taking care of the widows. And by the way, just as a sidelight, you know, that's the way it used to be. Churches took care of people. Because people were in churches. When people decided to leave the church, then the government felt like they have to take care of them. See, and so now the government began that thing called welfare. And the government provides people's needs because they've left the church. The church, if they were still in church and folks 
centered their life around the church, you know what? The church takes care of her own. And, and it did in these days. And so the church was taking care of the widows. But some were being neglected in their daily feeding, their daily food that was getting taken them. So the disciples said, all right, you choose out from among you seven men of honest report, and they're going to elect the first deacons, the first servants of the church, to serve the food to the widows. Okay? And so that's what's going on here in chapter 6. And notice verse number 5. The saying pleased the whole multitude, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Ghost, and Philip, and Procurus, and Nicanor, and Timon, and Parmenius, and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch. And when they were set before the apostles, when they, had laid, when they had prayed, they laid their hands on them. And the word of God increased, and the number of disciples multiplied in Jerusalem greatly, and a great company of the priests were obedient to the faith. And Stephen, full of faith and power, did great wonders and miracles among the people. Now look at verse 9. Then there arose certain of the synagogue, which is called the synagogue of the Libertines, and the Cyrenians, and Alexandrians. And of them of Cilicia and Asia, what are they doing? Disputing with Stephen. Now back up. Stephen, look at verse 5, a man full of faith and of the Holy Ghost. Look at verse 8, Stephen, full of faith and power, did great wonders and miracles among the people. Let me ask you a question. Stephen, a good guy or a bad guy? He's a very good guy. I mean, the Bible tells us that. And what are these people doing? Arguing with Stephen. Disputing what he's saying. And one of the groups here that's mentioned that's named is Alexandrians. Law of first mention, negative. Not a good mention. Of Alexandria. Let's go to the second time Alexandria is mentioned. Look at Acts chapter 18. Acts chapter 18. Acts chapter 18. Notice with me verse number 24. The Bible says, A certain Jew named Apollos, born where, church? Born in Alexandria. An eloquent man, mighty in the scriptures, came to Ephesus. This man was instructed in the way of the Lord. And being fervent in spirit, he spake and taught diligently the things of the Lord, knowing only the baptism of John. He began to speak boldly in the synagogue, whom when Aquila and Priscilla, those were helpers with Paul, okay? When Aquila and Priscilla had heard, they took him unto them and expounded unto him the way of God more perfectly when he was disposed to pass into Achaia, the brethren wrote, exhorting the disciples to receive him, who, when he was come, helped them much which had believed through grace. Now, let's stop. Here's Apollos. He's eloquent, mighty in the Scriptures. But do you notice what it says? He's preaching the baptism of John. Now, wait a minute. We're in the book of Acts. We're, we're past John. In fact, we're past Jesus coming. Jesus has come died, rose again, and ascended back to heaven. The early church has begun. The early church has, has already spread out of Jerusalem and, and, and begin to spread the gospel. And Apollos here is still preaching the baptism of John when he should be preaching Jesus Christ. So Aquila and Priscilla hear him, and they take him aside, and the Bible says, they, verse 26, they expounded unto him the way of God more perfectly. So what you have here is a man from Alexandria who had Bible teaching for sure, but he had incomplete Bible teaching. He wasn't preaching Jesus. He was preaching John's baptism. Now look what happened. After they asked to receive him, he helped them much, verse 27, which had believed through grace. Now look at verse 28. For he mightily convinced the Jews, and that publicly... Showing by the Scriptures the baptism of John. No, he didn't say that. Showing Now he's showing by the Scriptures what? Jesus was Christ. Now he's preaching Jesus. Now he's preaching that he's the Son of God. He's the Messiah. He's the Anointed One of God. He wasn't teaching that before. Until Aquila and Priscilla showed him the way of God more perfectly. So the second mention we have is associated, Alexandria is associated with incomplete Bible teaching. All right? 
Let's look at the third time it's mentioned. Look at Acts chapter 27. This is really interesting. Acts 27. Paul is arrested and he's appealed his case to Caesar. And so he has to be sent to Rome eventually to his execution. And the Bible says in verse number 6 of Acts 27 that there was there the centurion found a ship of Alexandria sailing into Italy and he put us thereon. So the ship that is going to take Paul to his execution in Rome, oddly enough, is from Alexandria. Crazy, isn't it? Why God would put that in the Bible and let us know that? But now let's look at Acts 28. Most of you know what happens to that ship. They get into a great storm in Acts 27, remember? And uh, they're, they, they think all hope's going to be gone. And Paul has been in praying to God, and, and God tells him, uh, everybody stays with the ship and it'll be okay. And Paul tells him, you stay with the ship, you'll be all right. And of course, the ship struck ground and it broke into pieces and everybody jumped on boards or wherever they could to paddle the way to shore. And everybody, notice the last words of, chap of chapter 27, verse 44, all escaped, all safe to land. All of them did. All of them were safe, just like Paul said they would be. All right? So now they're on an island called Melita or Melita in chapter 28 and verse 1. And it talks about the uh, barbarians there didn't show them any little kindness. This is where they kindled the fire. Paul threw some sticks on it and a viper, a snake gra grabbed him and he shook it off. They all thought, well, he's really the guilty criminal now. He's been bit by a snake. But when they thought he would die, he didn't show any ill effects at all. And then they thought, wow, this guy's got some kind of power. You know, and they, they didn't know what to think. But here they are for three months. And after three months, they're looking for another ship to get him to where? Remember, they're going to Rome, to where he's going to stay in trial and eventually be executed. And so they're waiting for a second ship. And look at verse number 11. After three months, we departed in a ship of Alexandria. What are the odds of another ship coming and the ship going to Rome is from Alexandria again? Same place. True enough, Alexandria. So all four references to Alexandria are negative. You're not, anybody who's honest now, the, wait, wait a minute, what's the final authority? Bible's are final authority. Nobody can look at Alexandria and Egypt and say, well, I think it's pretty positive. I think you have to be honest and say, you know what, these are all pretty negative comments that are made about Alexandria and Egypt. Now, we said something at the beginning that Alexandria was also, uh, that each, both these places, Antioch and Alexandria, had a, had a uh, philosophy, uh, ideology that went along with them. They were, they were centers of education and philosophy. There was a school of the scriptures at Alexandria. That's, that's probably what Apollos was a part of and where he learned some of the scriptures. Uh, Pantaneus was a philosopher. And, and here's, here's the important thing. Pantaneus believed the Bible should be interpreted philosophically and allegorically. That was his philosophy. That's his ideology. And so... Truth was relative, not absolute. He didn't believe the Bible was infallible. He believed that men like Adam, Noah, Moses, David only existed in Jewish poetry. They were not actual, literal people. Not true historical characters. He was succeeded uh, at the school by Clement of Alexandria and later by Origen of Alexander. And it was Origen who was, with his philosophy, who began to alter the manuscripts that were delivered to him. He's, he's the father, Origen would be the father of all those who believe there's mistakes and mistranslations in the Bible. And so he would begin to change the Bible, after all, the words aren't important, just the truth. Just so the truth gets across. The words don't matter. Okay? That's just the philosophy that he had. All right? Now, that's Alexandria and that's Egypt. Now, let's, 
go the other way and say, what about Antioch? Let's see what the Bible says about them. For that, you go back to Acts chapter 6. Would you go back there again, please? Acts chapter 6. What does the Bible say about Antioch? Acts 6 again. What's going on in Acts 6 again? They're electing the first deacons. They're uh, serving tables. And uh, he lists the deacons that are elected. Verse 5 again. Notice it says the saying, Please, O multitude, and they chose Stephen a man full of faith and of the Holy Ghost, Philip, Procurus, Nicanor, Timon, or Timon, Parmenas, and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch. Isn't that odd? By the way, who are these, who are these seven men that are listed? Deacons. And by the way, notice what it says in verse number three. Brethren, wherefore brethren, look Ye out among you seven men, here we go, honest report, full of the Holy Ghost, and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. So, these guys that are listed, good guys or bad guys? Pretty good guys. Full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, of honest report. And there's one guy who gets his hometown mentioned. And it's the guy from Antioch. What are the odds of that happening? Why would God, none of the other guys got their hometown mentioned. But Nicholas did. He was a proselyte of Antioch. And so the, the first, it's interesting too, the first time Antioch's mentioned, it's mentioned in the same chapter as the first time Alexander is mentioned. And they're on, they're on opposite sides of the fence. Alexandria disputing with Stephen while Antioch was one of the seven first deacons. Men of honest report, full of faith, and full of the Holy Ghost. Good guy. A good mention. And you'll see that its first mention then is in a positive light. Let's see if that continues. Look at Acts chapter 11. Acts chapter 11. You doing all right? Everybody okay? Aren't you glad you were in church tonight? I hope you mean that. Acts 11. Acts 11, notice with me, verse number 19. Now they, which were scattered abroad on the persecution that arose about Stephen, traveled as far as Phoenicia and Cyprus and Antioch, preaching the word to none but the Jews only. And some of them were men of Cyprus and Cyrene, which when they were come to Antioch, spake unto the Grecians, preaching the Lord Jesus. And the hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number believed and turned unto the Lord. So the, the gospel is spread because of the persecution. They've scattered preaching the gospel. Some get down to Antioch. They preach. A great number have been saved. A revival, if you will, is broken out in Antioch. Well, word's going to get back to the guys at Jerusalem. All right? Notice verse 22. Tidings of these things came unto the ears of the church, which was in Jerusalem, that they should send forth Barnabas, that he should go as far as Antioch. Okay, who are we going to send down here to help these guys? Let's send Barnabas. And so they send Barnabas down. Who, verse 23, when he came and had seen the grace of God, was glad and exhorted them all that with purpose of heart they would cleave unto the Lord. He was a good man, Barnabas, full of the Holy Ghost and of faith. And much people was added unto the Lord. So Barnabas leaves, verse 25, then departed Barnabas, to Tarsus for to seek Saul. And when he finds Saul, he takes him back to Jerusalem. No, that's not where he took him. Where did he take him? He brought him unto Antioch. That's interesting, isn't it? He didn't go back to Jerusalem. He stayed in Antioch. He got Saul and brought him to Antioch, and then look what happened. It came to pass that a whole year they assembled themselves with the church and taught much people, and the disciples were called Christians first, in Antioch. So here's first we see a great number saved in Antioch. A revival takes place. Then we find Barnabas goes down to Antioch to encourage them. And then the Bible says, much people were out of the Lord. Then he leaves and goes to get Saul. And he finds Saul. And upon, fi upon finding him, he doesn't take him back to Jerusalem where he came from. He takes him back to Antioch. And they, and they stay there and teach the people, and they're called Christians first, not in Jerusalem, in Antioch. 
And, and, and they're, they're, listen, Antioch is to the Christian what Plymouth Rock is to an American. That's where we drive our, our, our stake down. Because they were called Christians first in Antioch. Now, there's a shift that's happening here. And you know that happens because of the next verse. And you can read right over it if you're reading your Bible and miss it. But verse 27 is important. Notice what it says. And in these days came prophets from where? Unto where? From Jerusalem to Antioch. God is shifting the center of operations of the New Testament church from Jerusalem to Antioch. In fact, the rest of the chapter talks about how Antioch's taken up an offering to send it back to the poor church in Jerusalem. They're, they're having a hard time back there. And this church is thriving and growing. And the Lord's blessing the church. And so the church that God is blessing is sending an offering back to the church that God isn't blessing anymore. Now, let's look at next mention. Look at Acts 13. Acts 13 God is going to send out missionaries now to preach the gospel to the whole world. Wonder where we'll send the missionaries out from. Well, look at chapter 13, verse 1. Now they were in the church that was at Antioch. Certain prophets and teachers. And it lists who they were. And of course, they send out the first missionaries, Saul and Barnabas. Barnabas and Saul. When they returned from that missionary journey, guess where they came back? They reported back, chapter 14 and verse 25, they reported back to the church at Antioch. The second missionary journey, when you go to Acts 15, verse number 40, when remember the dissension between Paul and Barnabas about whether to take John Mark or not on the missionary journey? So they, they couldn't come to agreement, and Barnabas took John Mark and went his way. Paul chose Silas. And verse number 40 says, Paul chose Silas and departed, being recommended by the brethren under the grace of God. And they sailed out from Antioch. Now, we also said Antioch had a school, had a philosophy, had an ideology. All right? And in Antioch, there was a disciple named Lucian there. Lucian also had a school of the Scriptures. In Antioch, Lucian was known for his mistrust of pagan philosophy. So his school magnified the authority of Scripture. Lucian believed the Bible should be taken literally, not figuratively as the philosophers in Alexandria believed. And so, let's review. Egypt a place where they may kill you and steal your wife, a place where the Jews were in slavery, a place that God called a house of bondage, a place Moses called an iron furnace, a place where God said the king, any king of Israel is not to return to Egypt to get horses. And in Revelation, when God denounces Jerusalem, He calls it Sodom in Egypt. Alexandria, we have the Jews disputing with Stephen, a man full of faith, full of the Spirit of God. We have the incomplete Bible teaching of Apollos. We have the ship taking Paul to Rome that is destroyed in a storm, replaced by another ship from Alexandria that takes Paul to where he'll be beheaded in Rome. They have a school of the Scriptures there that teaches the Bible is allegoric, allegorical. It's to be interpreted philosophically. The truth is relative. There's no absolutes. And they weren't afraid to delete verses out of the manuscripts. Then you have Antioch. First deacons. When the first deacons mentioned, that the last deacon mentioned, his hometown is mentioned. Nicholas was from Antioch. After the persecution, a great number of people were saved in Antioch. Barnabas goes there, finds Saul, brings him back to Antioch. They teach the people there. They're called Christians first in Antioch. The prophets begin to move from Jerusalem to Antioch. 
The Christians send an offering to help the saints back in Jerusalem. Then the first missionaries get sent out from the church in Antioch. When they come back after the first missionary journey, they report back to the church at Antioch. The school of the scriptures in Antioch magnified the authority of God's word that the Bible was to be taken literally and not figuratively. Now, the question is this. If you had to pick where you want to get a Bible from, where would you want your Bible to come from? If you're honest, you have to say, I think my Bible ain't going to come from Antioch. Now let me tell you something. All the, that's why I said there's two Bibles. All the Bibles other than the King James Bible comes from Alexandrian manuscripts. All of them, including the new King James. They say, oh, it just updates the King James. No, they didn't update the King James. They went back to Alexandrian manuscripts. And they translated it from those. One, one Bible comes from Antioch. The King James Bible. It's the only one. All the others come from the other line of manuscripts. And God was so good to show us in the Scripture which one we should trust. Which one would be the correct one to have? Only the King James Bible comes from Antioch. That's, that's why we use the King James Bible. Now, let me, let, me, let me make sure we understand this. Don't, most people, I'm going to be honest, most people have no idea. You go to a bookstore, they'll do everything they can to sell you anything but a King James. And let me help you understand something, too. The King James, is you, they, they have fed it into computers that have the software that will tell you what reading level it is. The King James Bible comes out somewhere between a fourth and a fifth grade reading level. The NIV, seventh grade reading level. And mostly, all the new versions that come out, what do they always say? Easier to read. Easier to understand. But it's not true. It's a, it, it is, it's a false claim. By the way, the King James Bible is the only Bible that is not copyrighted. Now, if you have a note Bible, the notes in it are copyrighted. You may have a King James Bible and it's a Schofield Bible, or you may have a, uh, I think some people, some may have life application Bibles. Well, that's copyrighted because their notes are copyrighted. This, this is just a Bible. Nothing in it but Scripture. I could lay this on the copy machine and copy it all night long, all week long, and make copies and sell them, give them away. There's no copyright. I can't do that with any other version of the Bible. They're all copyrighted. They want money. I can't even lay it down and give them away. That's an infringement on their copyright. And by the way, and, and I'll just say, why all the different... Translations? Because there's money in it. I hate to say that, but it's true. There's money in Bibles. And so you find out that all the different versions, they all have different publishers, different publishing houses, because they make money that way. Now let me give you a couple interesting things about your Bible. The, how many of you know, most of you know this, What's the longest chapter in the Bible? Psalm 119. 176 verses, okay? Go ahead and turn there, would you? Psalm 119 has 176 verses. The shortest chapter in the Bible. Psalm 117. Two verses, okay? It's really interesting. The middle chapter of the Bible is Psalm 118. Do you have a pencil or a pen? There are 594 chapters before Psalm 118, and there's 594 chapters after Psalm 118. What's 594 plus 594? Nope. 
1188. 1188. You know what the middle verse of the King James Bible is? Psalm 118, verse 8. What a coincidence. Now, what does that verse say? Psalm 118, verse 8. It is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man. You think God's trying to send us a message? It's interesting. There's no middle word in that because there's 14 words in that verse. So you have to have a middle two words. So count in six words from the front and six words from the end. And you have a middle two words. What are the middle two words of the King James Bible? The The Lord. What a coincidence. And you say, well, I can find that in my... No, no, no. You have to understand, there's, there's I forget how many thousand of words, I think over 40,000 words taken out of the NIV Bible compared to the King James. Again, and that just goes back to the philosophy from which the manuscripts came from. Wor- the words for word. But when we read Psalm 12... And what Jesus said, he said, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words shall not pass away. Not just my word, my words, plural. Okay? Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Now, if God told us that we're to live by every word, how could we do that if he didn't give us every word? then he gave us a command we cannot possibly fulfill. We cannot possibly obey. Because we don't have his words. I don't, I don't, listen, I don't, I have, I have more confidence. I, I, I would, if you have, if you want to use another version of the Bible, then, then believe that that's God's word, that that is preserved and every word is true. Because if you don't, where's your authority? What is your authority? Because in many churches around the country today, you know what happened? People gathered for Sunday school classes and they gathered in a group of 12 in a room and somebody read the scripture and then they said, what's your Bible say? And they read out of their version and the next person read out of a different version. next person read out of a different version. Some of you, you've probably been in places like that. Oh, well, my Bible says this. Oh, well, mine says it this way. Well, which one is right? Which one has every word of God? We just, and, and by the way, if that's confusing, then I know this. God is not the author of confusion. Okay? He's not the author of confusion. So if it's confusing, God's not in it. And so that's why we hold to the King James Bible. In 2011, the King James Bible celebrated 400 years. No other Bible's been blessed like the King James Bible. And if you look at the world since 1611, you can see a pattern take place. Wherever the King James Bible has been used and lived and practiced, a major blessing took place. And this was the Bible upon which our country was founded. The United States of America. I believe we became one of the most blessed countries on earth Because from 1630 into the early 1900s, this was our Bible. And boy, the last hundred years, we've slid downhill real fast because we've gotten away from the Bible. Key to the missionary movement of the 18th century, 19th century, was the King James Bible. It's had a great impact on world missions. I think there's... Back to the verse we started with tonight, Psalm 12. Psalm 12, verses 6 and 7. Notice what the Lord said. The words of the Lord. Did you catch that? Not the word of the Lord. The words of the Lord are pure words. Has silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times times now when they're purified seven times he says thou shalt keep them O Lord thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever you had for the English speaking people 
You had Tyndale's New Testament that came out in 1526. You had the Coverdale Bible that came out in 1535. You had the Matthews Bible that came out in 1537. The Great Bible in 1539. The Geneva Bible in 1560. The Bishop's Bible in 1568. And the King James Bible in 1611. Tyndale, Coverdale, Matthews, the Great Bible, Geneva Bible, Bishop's Bible, King James Bible. Purified seven times. And thou shalt keep them, thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. It's a purified book. I believe the words of this book are pure words. I believe God's kept them and preserved them for us and, and his word. And, and now, 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 let, me, let me close by saying this. This isn't to go out and beat anybody over the head. I'd, I'd rather have somebody use a different version of the Bible who reads it and lives it and loves it than somebody who carries a King James and wants to tell everybody how great the King James is and they never read it and they don't live it and they don't do anything with it. Okay? That's not what it's all about. The Bible is to be lived. The Bible is to be loved. The Bible is to be read. The Bible is to be studied. The Bible is to be memorized. The Bible is to be meditated on. And, and don't, don't, don't get an attitude. Okay? One, one time we had somebody come in, they had a different version of the Bible, and we had somebody in the church say, uh, what are you carrying that junk around with you for? In, in Christian love, I wanted to backhand the guy. You know what? Don't, don't talk that way. What kind of spirit is that? You don't find that spirit in the King James Bible. Okay? We don't do that. But if, if we just start, and this is something that you can sit down with, with anybody and go through the Scripture with it. You don't have to be a scholar. It's laid out for us in the Bible, in plain English. Why we believe this book is God's word, kept for us in the English language. The B-I-B-L-E, yes, that's the book for me. But I'll tell you this, I don't want, just want to believe it. I want to live the book I believe. So let's make sure we're living by it. Amen? Let's pray together, shall we? Father, take the truth now this evening. Thank you, Lord, for everyone's attention tonight. Lord, I know this is a, a different kind of a message for us, and it's certainly more positional about what we believe and why we believe it. And, Lord, I just want to thank you tonight for the Bible. We're so, so thankful, and we're, we're privileged to hold copies of it in our hand tonight. And I pray, Lord, we realize what a precious treasure it is for us to have the very words of God. I don't believe it's the words of men or the words of a man. We believe it to be the very words of God. I believe it's quick, it's powerful, it's sharper than a two-edged sword. I pray that it's accomplished what you wanted it to in the lives of people tonight. And I pray you've spoken to people's hearts as only you can. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. I'll finish praying in just a moment. We'll have our invitation tonight. And I wonder tonight, just I wonder how many folks would say, you know what, Pastor, that was something I'd never heard before. Or maybe you hadn't heard it in a long time or anything like that. And you say, you know, tonight I understand why the King James Bible is the Word of God. Never really clearly understood why, why all the different Bibles. Now I know there's only two sources. I mean, to just, 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 we just say, you know what? The Spirit of God dealt with my heart tonight. And Pastor, I appreciate you praying for me this evening. I'm really considering what I've heard this evening. God has dealt with my heart. Would you say pray for me and slip your hand up tonight? God bless you. Amen. Amen. God bless you. You may put them down. Father, thank you for speaking to hearts tonight. Lord, I pray that your will will be done now in this invitation time. Maybe some of us ought to just bow our knee and ask you to forgive us for not loving our Bible like we ought to, not treasuring it like we ought to. 
not living it like we ought to. I pray that each of us would value your words in our life and give it the place in our life that we ought to. I pray your will be done now in this invitation. Thank you for speaking to our hearts tonight. Have your own way now in every heart and life, and I'll thank you for it. With your heads bowed, stand to your feet. As you stand to your feet, our pianist will play. As she plays, I want you to respond to what God's told you to do. Will you please? Have thine own way, Lord. Have thine own way. Thou art the potter. I am the clay. Mold me and make me after thy will. While I am waiting, yielded and still. Have thine own way, Lord. Have thine own way. Search me and try me, Master, today. Whiter than snow, Lord, wash me just now. As in thy presence, humbly I bow. Have thine own way, Lord, have thine own way. Wounded and weary, help me, I pray. Power, O oh power.